Um, so my name is Kamran Mirza. As Stephanie just said, I am a pathologist. Um, I'm a husband, uh, a girl dad of three. A pathologist is a physician uh, that deals with the diagnosis of disease. So all of you listening, if you have ever been to a doctor, uh, you, you had another doctor in that team, you just never saw them. And that doctor is a pathologist. Uh, we work behind the scenes mostly. Um, and we deal with the diagnosis of human disease, looking at tissues or specimens from humans. And so our work is at the cellular level, right? So we look at the specifics of what your cells are telling us, right? Are the cells telling us that the cells are normal or are they telling us that there's something happening to them, right? And so we interpret that. Wonderful. So, you know, let's go there now. Let's talk about it almost in this, you know, path of, from a patient experience perspective. So I remember, um, you know, I can't even remember, like going into UCSF for that first week, they wanted yeah. to run tests because they knew it was lymphoma, but they needed to figure out like T cell, B cell, which kind of lymphoma, all yeah. these things. So yeah. I had, you know, um, lymph node biopsies, um, bone marrow biopsy, million scans. But in terms of the biopsies, and even the blood work, like what is being done by the pathologist? And, and if you walk us through how long it takes, so it helps yeah. inform us, like what's going on? Often patients um, think that the tissue has gone into this black box. And actually many of my physician colleagues don't really know what's happening in the pathology lab too. It's kind of a, it's kind of a mystery for some reason, but, you know, rest assured that once your sample goes away from your site, it's being taken care of, you know, to the highest degree of care. Um, and whether it be blood or whether it be, you know, bone marrow or a different type of biopsy, there's certain similarities in the ways we process those specimens to be able to interpret them. Some will be faster, some will be slower, and it really does depend on what type of information we're looking for. So for example, in a, in, in a blood specimen, if we can just use that as an example, it's a relatively, um, you know, you know, it's a relatively simple biopsy if you think about it, right? It's just a, you know, a needle prick and you get the blood and then we can do several things to it. We can smear it on a slide and look at the cells. We can count the cells. We can see if the cells are looking normal or abnormal. And then our machines in our laboratories, in our clinical laboratories, they're medical laboratory scientists that are working with these samples to make sure that the numbers are okay and everything looks normal. In case machines or human beings, whoever's looking at those cells, see something abnormal, then those are flagged for review by a physician, who, which is a pathologist, right? And so as a hematopathologist, I get to see in the morning all the flagged smears that have probably something abnormal. And then I have to triage and see, is this abnormal in that it's malignant? Is it abnormal in that it's reactive? Like, you know, who is the person you know, I always give this example that if a six-year-old has a fever and a high white count, who is the person who will tell their physician whether this is an infection or leukemia? And the answer is coming from the laboratory, right? Because the presentation will be very similar. The patient will be, will be might have a fever, might feel poorly, right? And the white count will be increased. But then we have to look at the cells and say, are they malignant cells or are they reactive cells, right? And so that's it's an incredibly important and really like a major responsibility to get that call correct. So for example, if a patient has an infection, um, there, you know, there's an increase in cells that is a react, it's a, it's an, it's a reaction to the infection, right? So for example, if it's a bacterial infection in the blood, there'll be lots of neutrophils, which is a particular type of cell. So if I see tons of neutrophils as the reason for the increase in the white cell count, my guess will be, okay, this is likely a reaction to the patient's infection. So my recommendation would be check out, you know, the microbiology studies or see if the patient has an infection, this makes sense. But then there could be lymphocytes, which is a completely different kind of thinking about what type of infection it could be. There could be monocytes, and then there could be immature cells. And when we're going to immature cells in the in the degree of their maturation, that's where we can start wondering about or worrying about, okay, this may not be a reaction. This could be a malignancy that's causing the increase in the cells. So things like that can be quick. So the turnaround for that, depending on how long it takes for the specimen to get to the laboratory, you know, we can report certain things within an hour, right? So those are fast things. But then when you take tissue, you know, if we move to biopsies, when we take tissue from the human body, 
whether this be in surgery or whether this be a biopsy, you know, what, what have you, that material needs to be processed in order for it to then come as a slide to the microscope, right? And that usually uh, involves some element of, of fixation. Um, I know, you know, just a couple more questions there. One of the most common, te- you know, sort of tests in the lab work is the complete blood count. Um, and a lot of, you know, hit, you know, blood cancer patients have to do a lot of these. And even in the beginning and getting diagnosed, you know, there are certain things that you were saying you look for. So there's a difference in neutrophils numbers and lymphocytes. They all indicate different things. Would you be able yeah. to give a summary of some of what you're looking for with each of them? Like, Great questions. All right. So in a in a complete blood count, what you're getting is a bunch of information. Uh, the information you're getting, like I mentioned before, is that there are three main types of blood cells that we're looking for. The red blood cells, and there's some parameters that involve the red blood cells, right? Typically with red blood cells, you think of oxygen carrying capacity. So your ability to carry oxygen. And the usual thing that patients or your listeners may know about is anemia, right? So that's when you have less hemoglobin, which is less red blood cells and so anemia means that you can probably get tired more and you have a lower ability to carry oxygen to different parts of your body, right? Anemia can be due to a variety of reasons from dietary deficiencies to malignancies. And so it's impossible to tell just by anemia what the disease is, but that's a sign, right? That's what, what it's showing up with. So there are a bunch of things on the CBC that talk about the red blood cells, right? And so that's hemoglobin, hematocrit, the, you know, we're looking at the numbers that are telling us the size of the red cells, the numbers that are telling us about the, you know, the differences in size of the cells. So you may not need to know about all of those different granular things, right? But the hemoglobin is probably the thing that stands out the most. And it's different. The ranges are a little bit different in men or in women. Uh, but by and large, that's your oxygen carrying capacity. The second number that you probably see up there is the WBC or the white blood cell count, right? The white blood cells are five or, you know, five different types of cells or six different types of cells that all get lumped together and there's a range for them. So if you have an increase in them, that again could be an increase in one type of cell, it could be an increase in all five types of cells, or it could be a decrease, right? And so in that case, it could be a decrease of one particular type of cell or multiple types of cells, right? So those are known as leukocytosis is when there's more cells and leukopenia is when there's less cells. So again, that number has a reference range. We look at the cells and we count what different types of cells there are. And you'll see that in the report. If there's a differential count, you'll see neutrophil, the words neutrophils, lymphocytes, monocytes, basophils, eosinophils. So these are all the different types of white blood cells. Um, and then, you know, again, we can be very granular in what's exactly happening, but, you know, these are all these are all pointing if there are differences or changes, you know, or if it's falling outside the range, something is likely causing that. It could be a simple viral infection, or it again could be a malignancy, right? And so it, it's up to a lot of interpretation and probably additional testing before we can come up with it. And the last number that you look at is the platelet count or the PLT. The platelet count is these are little tiny little, uh, you know, things or, you know, cells, I guess they're just fragments of cells. Uh, that are floating around and they help you clot. So for example, you know, so they, they stop bleeding. So for example, if your platelet count is low, you might be getting bruises, you might be bleeding from, you know, the mouth or the nose or something because your clotting isn't working. So again, like, you know, very basically, like these are the things and human beings, nothing is yes or no, really, it's a lot of like gray zones. And so they're, so their reference ranges based on, you know, your age, there are some references could be different, uh, sometimes based on multiple different things, it could be different, right? Your gender, it could be different. Um, and so that's basically the report. And then depending on some people have reached out to me and like there's a minor, minor increase in something which I don't think is such a big deal because of experience. But for them, it's like, oh, it's flagged, it's, it's up. But, you know, with all tests, it's difficult for patients to be able to predict whether a small d- increase or decrease is a big deal or not. But your physician, because of vast experience, can, you know, kind of help guide you. But by and large, for the most part, hopefully if you're healthy, all of those numbers are falling within the reference range and everything is okay. Yeah, you know, it's so interesting because 
I, I didn't really feel like there was anything so different in my blood, you know, my blood work in the beginning is only after I started chemo. <laughs> and then of course, everything right. took a dive. So it's, in, of course, there's so many nuance, so many different situations that these things could be. If I may reference, I mean, you brought up your case, right? If I may reference that. Um, so for example, in cases of lymphoma, you know, lymphoma, as you know, occurs, you know, it can occur anywhere in the body, but it may occur in lymph nodes. And if the lymphoma is just restricted to the lymph nodes, then the presentation of the patient might be with tiredness and fever and with these lumps, right, that you can feel. But if it hasn't come out into the blood yet, the blood work may still be normal, right? And so that's why I'm referencing that, you know, maybe your blood work isn't, isn't going to be different in the beginning. If it spills out into the blood, then lymphoma is a malignancy of lymphocytes. So you could see abnormal lymphocytes, which would increase the number. And when we'd look at them, we'd probably be able to tell that they are not normal. Alternatively, if malignancies affect the bone marrow, right? So the bone marrow is the factory where all of the different cells are produced. If a malignancy is primary to the bone marrow, then the, all the blood numbers will be off. And if a malignancy is metastatic to the bone marrow, let's say there's a lung cancer or a breast cancer or what have you, and it's also metastasized to the bone marrow, then those numbers can also start looking off, right? And so it's a spectrum of possibilities of you know what that means, right? The blood could be completely normal and the patient has disease in the bone marrow. Like it's possible, there's redundancy, right? In the, I mean, there's so much bone marrow that's being produced in our bones, right? And so I think it depends on where you are in the disease. It depends on how this, you know, how extensive the disease is and, and most importantly, what type of disease it is. So tissue, fresh tissue, as you know, will start degrading very quickly. So we have to immediately take the tissue and put it in a fixative so that the cellular form and the cellular biology is kind of frozen for us to be able to process it. So normally that's formal in fixation, even though there are multiple other types of fixatives, but we, you know, we process this tissue, we, we fix it in formalin, and then we embed it in like this wax, which is paraffin. And then we cut thin sections of it. And those sections come on our slides. So that, you know, that process can take a few hours, right? The fixation takes a few hours, depending on what time it is, it could be overnight, right? I mean, so we're now looking at going into the next day. After the, the, the tissue is on the slide, it's kind of see-through, it's just transparent. So we have to put a stain on it or, a, or lots of stains on it to see what the tissue is looking like, right? So that takes a couple more hours. And then based on what we see, it could be an instantaneous answer that everything looks normal, it's just normal tissue, or it could require additional studies. So for example, if I take the example of lymphoma, it's not enough to just say, um, you know, it's lymphoma. As you mentioned yourself, we have to figure out if it's B cell or T cell. And then within that, you know, or is it Hodgkin lymphoma? And then within that, are there certain markers that that we know will give a better prognosis or a worse prognosis? This could involve looking at a patient's uh, the, in the tumor, looking at the, the genes, looking at mutations, looking at chromosomes. And so this can now take from a couple of days to like weeks. Um, and, you know, and that naturally can be very frustrating for the patient who's waiting for that answer. But I want, you know, I want all of the people listening to know that they, they, they can be rest assured that we are very aware, acutely aware of the fact that delays cause more stress. But that if there is a delay or if not a delay, but if it's taking a long time, we are in the process of getting the correct answers so that you're in, in my case, the hemonc, for example, can, can consider the state of diagnosis and prognosis so they can think about therapy appropriately. So, you know, it's nice to be able to get a preliminary, uh, you know, answer. And we often do that. Like I'll pick up the phone and call the hemonc and say, okay, it's looking malignant. So this will take some time, Right. And then it's up to them to triage depending on how the patient is. Are they kind of calm or are they very stressed out? And that's the side we don't deal with because we don't see patients directly. Um, but more often than not, for example, if I, you know, I'm on service today, if there were any surprise diagnoses, malignant diagnoses, I have called my, the, my clinician, like patient-facing colleagues, and given them a heads up that this is happening so they can 
temper kind of the expectation of how long it'll take. One last thing I will say um, is that there are many resources out there uh, about interpreting your pathology report. I think that there is a nice resource out from Canada called mypathologyreport.ca. Um, there are other resources through the American Society of Clinical Pathology, through the College of American Pathologists, through different support groups for patients, right? I mean, and so I think that there are mechanisms you know, and, and many of us pathologists are actually on social media, find us, right? If any of your listeners have leukemia, lymphoma, whatever, my DMs are open on Twitter, find me. You know, I may not be able to answer immediately. And in general, I don't offer medical advice through social media, but I might be able to answer some very basic educational questions, right? Which aren't specific to cases. Um, and I think that that's very important in this world where we're so connected. Uh, you know, hopefully your listeners, if they're patients or if their loved ones are patients, they can find the resources that they need. And I hope that through your amazing work that you're doing, we can help connect people to those resources.